The title of the message is Soul Winning, Food for Revival. What is the vision of our church? Awesome. I think the kids' church might have heard you. Let's try that again. What's the vision of our church? Look around you right now. There's a lot of empty chairs for our friends, our families, and those that are in our neighborhoods that could be here with us. Okay? Let's pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for every member that is here today, Lord, that their heart and their minds would receive a word from you. Lord, that there would be no condemnation, there is no blame. Father, we pray the Holy Spirit would convict us to change. That your last command would be our first priority, that our lives would not be set on self, but on others. Lord, we want to be a soul-winning church that breeds and breathes revival. Open our hearts, Lord, and put that burden on us. Let us understand where it comes from. That, Lord, it's from you, it's your heart. That none would be lost, but that all would come to the saving knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We ask you to have your way in this place. Move in power. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Because we do believe in the Bible, we're going to start with a verse. Is that good? John 4, 31 to 35. In the meantime, his disciple urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready white for harvest. Come on. How many of you guys like food? Don't lie. You're in church. Okay? I love food. Me and food have been friends for a long time. We've had a great relationship, and we're not breaking up. Okay? Think about this. When you're hungry, how do you feel other than just hungry? I mean, how do, what emotions are elicited? Me? There's a word they come up with. It's called hangry. <laughs> hungry and angry. Yep. If I'm hungry, I get into a bad mood. Do we just sit around hungry? No, we do something about it, right? We find a way to put some food into our face. <laughs> One thing I like, I mean, there's these places, it's called like Golden Corral, Hometown Buffet, and for those of us that are old enough to remember furs, those are the all-you-can-eat places that you go to when you eat all you can. You know what I mean? I go in there and it's like, okay, I've got me, my wife, and three girls with me. I'm going to eat a plate for me, and then I'm going to cover them to make sure I get my money's worth. Okay? That kind of eating is like Thanksgiving, right? You go away stuffed, ready for a nap. That's important to know because as we are in the physical, so we should be in the spiritual. We love physical food. What about the spiritual food? In 2 Peter, it says to desire the sincere milk of the word, for thereby you will grow. The word of God is our spiritual food. So we need to be eating that as much, if not more, than the physical food. What happens when you eat too much physical food? You grow. Sometimes they're not in the right places. That doesn't happen when you're spiritually full. You grow in all the right places. Okay, that was just getting into it. We haven't got started yet. All right, point one. Food to do his will. Okay, we already know what food is, but let's be smart and actually define it. Any nourishing substance that is eaten drunk or otherwise taken into the body to sustain life, provide energy, promote growth. In John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is to do the Father's will. A lot of people say, man, being a Christian is hard. Christian means little Christ. I don't know that statement Jesus said right there was pretty simple. My food is to do the will of the Father. Is that complicated? Only if you don't know what the will of the Father is. And you gain that knowledge by reading his word. 
How many disciples do we have in here? Okay, I see hands. If you're a disciple, I want you to say yes. yes. Okay, great. So you can't say, I don't know what my purpose is or what I'm supposed to do because it's supposed to be Christ-like. Disciple means learner and follower of Christ. What did Christ say? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So I tricked you. So you need to know. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So you know what your purpose is. You know what the will of God is. Because it says God's heart is that none would be lost. If that don't convict you enough, let's give you some benefits of it. Because a lot of people, they're like, man, okay, what's in it for me? I mean, yeah, I know we're in church and nobody here feels that way. Nobody here has ever thought, man, I would do that, but what's in it for me? Well, there's three benefits to winning souls. One, personally, it fuels us and provides us energy. I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of friends and people that I've invited, even people at my life group, that have gotten saved. And you want to talk about an extreme input of energy. When you see somebody raise their hand, it brings an immediate joy inside of you. How many of you guys, when people answer the altar call, get excited and clap and are praising God for that? Yeah. If you're not, check your heart. Because it says, even the angels rejoice over one sinner coming back to God. Yeah, yeah. And if the angels who are sitting in the presence of God every single day rejoice for one sinner coming back, how much more should we who have the life and the Holy Spirit living in us? Okay, the second benefit is in our life groups. It motivates everyone. If you've ever had a life group that feels stagnant or people aren't really participating, come on, you get connected when somebody that you bring gets saved. It generates a momentum and an energy that continues to make that life group more and more prosperous every week thereafter. If people aren't getting saved, it's just a group meeting. Okay? And the third benefit it benefits the church because it sustains life and it promotes growth. I am super happy for every person here. Just think about if every one of you brought one person next week, there would be standing room only in here. Yeah. Let that sit because we need to be inviting. If you're in here and you go to a life group and you think, man, my life group kind of doesn't grow, it's boring. It's because we're not feeding on the food that Jesus fed on. That's not our life's purpose. That's not what we seek in the morning when we wake up and ask God to give us an opportunity to speak the word of hope to someone. How many of you guys know someone around you that's hurting, that are hopeless, that are lost? If you know they are, you have the cure inside of you. His name is Jesus. Winning souls and making disciples is our food, it's our energy, and it's our power. I'm getting ready to read something to you. I don't know who said it because it said source unknown. It says, return to the cross of Golgotha, which is skull or Calvary. I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I'm recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap, at a crossroad of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. And at that kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble, because that is where he died, and that is what he died about. And that is where Christ's men and women ought to be and what church people ought to be about. We ought to be about doing his will. Enough said on point one. I think that was kind of heavy. Point two, food to finish his work. Have any of you guys ever started something and didn't finish it? Guys, if you're married, don't, don't lie. You know you started some stuff and didn't finish it. And our wives are very awesome to remind us, go finish it. That's what Jesus finished his work. 
He knew what his work was. He didn't stop till it was complete. John 17, 4 says, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. John 19, 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. In Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Testimony is what you have to bring life into someone else. People can argue the Bible all day long. They can't argue what Jesus has done in your life because it's already happened. Your testimony is built on the gospel of Jesus. That's remained for over 2,000 years and has not changed. It's the truth. People cannot ignore the truth. We have to be ready to testify on Christ's behalf of all the goodness and hope and love that he's brought into our lives, what he's delivered us from. What chains have you been broken off your life? Because that testimony gives encouragement and hope to others. Food fuels us and provides energy. It motivates us. There's, there's a word used in the military and in a lot of other places, but it's called a ration. You guys know what a ration is? Well, check it out. In the military, they would give you an MRE, one for breakfast, one for lunch, one for dinner. You would get three rations, but that was your daily allotment. In the spiritual realm, we all that are in Christ have been given a daily allotment of souls that we need to touch for Jesus. People say, oh, man, it's all about the numbers. There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. Jesus cares about numbers. It says that he knows the very numbers of hair on your head, even if it's stubble. He knows it. Okay, there was a time when Jesus called his disciples out of the sea, and he actually numbered the fish that was caught, 153. Numbers count. When you go before Jesus, he's going to say a number. Did you touch that many people with the word and the hope of God? We're called to finish the work. That's our food, and we need to spiritually be filled so that we fulfill our ration. In sales, it's called a quota. We have a quota for Jesus, and we need to meet it. All right, point three. Say power. power. <laughs> that was weak. Say power like you mean it. Because point three is food, power for the harvest. John 4, 35 says, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are ready white for harvest. Those of you who don't know the story of the woman at the well is about a Samaritan woman that came to the well to draw water, and Jesus was kicking it by the well, waiting for his disciples who went off into Samaria to get some food. And the lady came to draw the water, now, if you didn't know, I'm just telling you this in my terms. This is, go back and read it. It's in John 4. Jesus says, hey, give me a drink. And she says, why are you asking me for a drink? You're a Jew. Jews don't even talk to us. And he said, if you knew who it was that's asking you for a drink, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water, and you would never thirst again. Well, there was a whole lot of discussion going on during this time, and then at the end of it, she was amazed because Jesus told her everything that she had done. She went off into the city. And as you continue to read, it said that she came back with the whole city. She went and testified of what Jesus had shown her and revealed to her. And she didn't keep it to herself. She couldn't. She told everybody that she saw, and they followed her to Jesus. When you tell people of what Jesus has done in your life, they will want to come to know him, and they can receive him. 
The woman did not go to church folk. She didn't go to the Pharisees or religious people. She went to everybody. We need to bring everyone that we can. We need to invite the multitudes of people that you encounter every day at work, at school, when you're out and about. Ask the Lord to give you the opportunity to share his goodness to someone. Again, I've asked, and a couple people raise their hands. The rest of you guys, I don't know. Maybe you're not paying attention. But there are people hurting around us each and every day. All you have to do is get out of your own life. Open your eyes, and you'll see it. How many of you guys have, you know, bouts with depression? Guess what? Quit looking at self. Look at others, and that depression will go away. You'll find that there's a lot more people worse off than you, and you'll stop feeling so inward because we're called to be outward. William Booth, you're like, who's William Booth? He was one of the guys that started Salvation Army. One Sunday evening, he was walking in London with his son, Bramwell. That's a strong name right there, Bramwell, who was then 12 or 13 years old. The father surprised the son by taking him into a saloon. If those of you who don't watch Westerns, that means it's a modern-day bar, okay? The place was crowded with men and women, many of them bearing on the faces the marks of vice and crime. Some were drunk. The fumes of alcohol and tobacco were poisonous. Willie Booth said to his son, these are our people. These are the people I want you to live for and bring to Christ. Years later, Bramwell Booth wrote, that impression never left me. We have to care about those that are sick, those that are hurting. Jesus even said, those that are well don't need a doctor. Those that are sick need a physician. Who did he hang out with? Tax collectors, prostitutes, the sick, the lame, the diseased. How many of us walk by someone and don't even give them a second look because of the status or situation of life that they're in? How many look at the bums on the street or the people that are hurting, holding up signs and think, psh, ain't giving you anything. All you want to do is go get drunk. We need to have a heart for those people because Jesus had a heart for us. Someone had a heart for us to invite us, to speak to us. Who are we to judge ourselves better than them? As William Booth said, that needs to be our DNA, to see souls one to Jesus. We are called to harvest. This story is going to get you. If you don't really care about the lost, this is going to bring it home, okay? In one of his sermons, E.V. Hill, he was a huge huge pastor, tells of a time when he preached in Michigan with Dr. Jack Hiles, the former pastor of First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana. Hiles Church averaged 20,000 in Sunday school back then. Yes, 20,000. It's a lot of zeros. E.V. asked, Jack, let me in on why you are so caught up in winning souls. You're on the verge of being a fanatic. What's behind all that? He said, one night I was awakened by this piercing scream from my sister. I ran upstairs to her bedroom, and there she was sweating and in hysterics. I shook her, and I couldn't get her attention, so I had to slap her. I said, what's wrong? You had a dream. She said, no, no dream. I said, you had a nightmare. She said, no, it was real. I said, what happened? She said, Jack, I just got back from hell. After a few miles of the glitter and lights and all that which deceives mankind, there was nothing but desolation. It was a bummed out situation. It's nothing but desolation and hopelessness. You walk towards the gates of hell knowing that you will never again be free. I got to the gates of hell and the keeper said, hold it. I stood outside hell and I saw people whose faces were twisted and tongues were thick, eyes bulging and hands split, dropping blood. I said, sir, please let some air in. And he said, no air in hell. Then I said, kind sir, let them have a drink of water. And he said, no water in hell. Then I said, if that's true, let them die. And he said, no death in hell. She said, my God, how long will they suffer? 
And he said, forever and ever. Hell has no exit and there is no death. She said, just as I turned to leave, he said, go back and tell the story. And just as I turned, I saw daddy. And I said, yep, our daddy is in hell because he never got around to doing the most important thing. He schooled us, he fed us, but he never got around to saying yes to Jesus Christ. Jack concluded by saying, I win souls every day so that nobody else's daddy has to go to hell. Today is the day to win souls. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. Neither are the people that we walk by, work with, go to school with. No one's guaranteed the next day. People have all kinds of excuses about why it's okay to wait. We have to win, and winning produces winning. We have to work hard to get the momentum in our life groups and in our church winning, making a streak of winning every single week, people coming forward on the altar call, giving their lives to Jesus because it matters. It matters for eternity. Let me give you the last verse in the message version. John 4, 34 to 35. Jesus said, The food that keeps me going is that I do the will of the one who sent me, finishing the work he started. As you look around right now, wouldn't you say that in about four months, it will be time to harvest. Well, I'm telling you, open your eyes and take a good look at what's right in front of you. These Samaritan fields are ripe. It's harvest time. I submit to you, these Arizonan fields are ripe. These Phoenix, Gilbert, Chandler, Mesa fields are ripe. We need to open our eyes and see the fields and ask the Lord, send us into the harvest. Empower me to fulfill your work. To do your will and to bring in the harvest. Please stand up. I want you guys to close your eyes. I want you to really understand that people are ready. Their hearts are prepared by the call of God. Before we ever speak a word to them, God has already prepared them for that place. The gospel to the hopeless brings hope. The unloved receive an understanding that they are loved and accepted. And the lost find that there is clear direction in following Jesus. If no one shares the gospel with them, how will they know? God has sent you and me. Are we ready to eat the food that Jesus fed on? The will of the Father. You know, a lot of sermons are awesome and they're fun, but then there's those sermons that cut deep. Right now, I want you not to feel condemnation for days that are past, but to feel the conviction to change and move forward. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray right now over our congregation. Lord, over me and every single person here, Lord, that you would put a burning desire in our heart, a burden for the lost. Lord, that you would open up our spiritual eyes that we could see the condition of those people that are around us and not just see it, but Lord, see it with compassion that causes us to move and make a difference in their life. A compassion to alleviate their suffering through sharing our testimony and the good news that's found in the gospel. Holy Spirit, we need your power. We need words of wisdom and knowledge. We need revelation so that we can step into that place that you've called us to be. Lord, that we would not live our lives for ourselves, but we would live to do your will. We would eat your word to fulfill your purpose. Lord, we ask for spiritual growth that we would desire your word more than the physical food that we love, that we are thankful that you give us. Lord, I just pray life over each and every person here that they would give that life away 
And that life is found only in Christ Jesus. For only in Him is our spirit made alive. Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity to join you in your work. Lord, strengthen us and use us that your name would be glorified and magnified in all the world, that we would not be satisfied with the salvation of just us and our homes. But Lord, like your heart says, that none would be lost. That we would pick up the call of making sure no one else's dad goes to hell. No one's sister goes to hell. No one's grandma goes to hell. No one's coworker goes to hell. Lord, it is our call to keep people from going into hell by sharing your good news and giving them an opportunity to know you and to be changed. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.